Hello and welcome to the Gnosticast. The Gnosticast is where it goes through each movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order and we discuss our analysis and research findings. Today we have a, I guess, a special one because it is The Cat Returns from 2002, once again, a rarity, a movie not directed by Miyazaki or Takahata. There will be, there will be more of those coming up in this decade because now in the 2000s, 2010s, that will have a lot more movies not directed by the correct Miyazaki. Oh, I should say, <laughs> and, and, and Takahara, this one is Hiroyuki Morita. Uh, interestingly enough, a director with not a lot of other directing uh, credits other than Bokurano. And uh, as always, you can find this podcast also available as an audio version. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, you can head to Libsyn. You can find it on Spotify. You can find it on, what's it called? Apple Podcasts. I think that's what it's called. And if you're just looking for an MP3 download, Libsyn's got you covered. Link in the description. So with me today, a small and cozy, uh, my small and cozy company of Hipster Kusulu. Uh, we're here to re- to review my favorite uh, Dr. Zeus story, The Cat in the Hat Comes Back, <laughs> or whatever this one is. <laughs> and we have Plate on Skull. Meow. Meow, indeed. Um, and me, Nyad, as always. Plate's so, already turn- turning into a cat. He's been here too long. <laughs> <He's>, uh... <laughs> he did leave before dawn. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Cat, Recon, uh, Cat Returns, also known in Japanese as uh, Neko no Ongaishi, which re- translates as The Cat's Repayment. Maybe it's a little bit uh, pressing to note this, as uh, the word Ongaishi has some narrative connotations in Japanese, which perhaps this translation misses. Um, we'll get into those a little bit later, but as already said, it's from 2002, directed by Hiroyuki Morita, and... You know, another thing that kind of makes this special is that it's, I think, the first thing Ghibli made, which we can just straight up consider a spin-off of one of their previous works. Because um, if you listened to the Whisper of the Heart cast we released uh, a few months back, um, the story the main girl is writing in Whisper of the Heart is, of course, The Cat Returns. It is this, which we're, which we're now going to be talking about. So this uh, makes it stand out a little bit in the Ghibli uh filmography as one of I think to this day the only occasion of them making a sequel or spin-off to one of their own works right yeah it's a weird thing because it's not necessarily a sequel or a spin-off it's like a like a in-universe story kind of deal it has have the it, character it, of the Baron show back up but he's like a proper character now yeah and we it, also get a uh, moon or Muta as he's known the fat cat oh he's he also in the moon. story as well yeah um, yeah, the uh, fat cat. It's re- recurring characters, like like it, it. It's more like the relationship between like um, uh, Tatami Galaxy and uh, um, Night Night Short Walk on yeah. Girl, because uh, uh, bo- except those two are like were like made by the same uh, director and had the like almost exact same aesthetic. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's a couple of returning characters, uh, and and it's sort of a meta sequel uh, because the. Where Whisper, Whisper of the Heart, uh, of course, dealt with uh, this young girl who um, wanted to like write write a story, and and like, but, but by the end of the film, kind of became an author, like uh, wrote the story. And I think it's Im- the implication is that this film is like the story she ended up writing, or at least something close to it. Uh, does does that track uh, for you guys? Yeah, that 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 seems to be uh, tracking. Also, you know, I just noticed right now. Um, because I'm going to take this uh, ahead of time a little bit for all of our listeners. Um, this movie isn't your usual Ghibli greatness. I don't want to diminish the movie, but it is very, very different in texture and quality from all the other Ghibli canon. canon. But, you know, honestly, thinking about it now, the old man in Wisp of the Heart did say it's like, it needs polishing, right? And, and you know, <laughs> this, this one sure yeah. needs polishing. Oh, damn, that was foreshadowing. They knew, they knew ahead of time. They knew ahead of time, yeah. And so, genuinely, I do wonder about this a little bit because the uh, an interesting part of what uh, happened in the production cycle of this movie, or rather, it was one of the reasons in producing this movie, and we're going to get into more details about this, but one of the things Miyazaki said, well, the reason he gave it to a, a young, inexperienced director and a lot of other young, inexperienced staff was to have it for them as like a testing ground. He literally straight up said that. 
And now I'm thinking about it, right? Whisper of the Heart had this motif of, you know, a young artist like trying for the first time to really dedicate herself to something and trying to make it work and an old man being kindly and watchful over it saying, well, it's a diamond in the rough, you know, we got to polish this, but I think you should, you should, you should go, you should go and pursue a dream of writing, animating, directing, you know? And I think Miyazaki kind of really inhibits this role here. And very clearly, this is, uh, uh, as I said, a rough, rough little movie. <laughs> mm. Uh, I, I believe the project started out uh, as just like as a, a small little uh, collaboration with a theme park. Um, exactly. Like a, a cat themed uh, theme park. It was like the, the cat project, you know? Yeah. yeah. So a theme park wanted to have like a cat themed ride from Studio Ghibli. They commissioned them. This, I think, falls neatly into the legacy of other commissions that uh, Ghibli have done and then turned into a whole, whole damn movie, which is Poco Rosso, which was as you remember, originally intended to be for a, a, an airplane a company, like an on in-flight movie little thing, yeah. like a 20-minute whatever. Uh, also the same for, for Kiki, if I recall. It was originally supposed to be for, like this delivery service ad, but then it kind of just became its own thing. Yeah, true. That that, that was also one of the things. So, uh, uh, good old... I, uh, now I wonder how often they've actually just straight up made a small little collaboration with a like advertisement and like it didn't turn into a project. They've made tons of short films and adverts, so that's not a surprise. Okay, yeah. So, see, uh, even though being an old, you know, old disillusioned Marxist leftist, you know, even Miyazaki knows the hustle. You gotta bring in the money. You gotta bring in yeah. the money. You gotta build your fancy little uh, studio with like all the trees and like everything being nice for all your employees who you will work through uh, 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 um, 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 crunch times and crazy work hours. But you know, it's nice. It's it's looking nice. Yeah. Um, also, yeah. also a, a good trick is to like put a lot of your like uh, Marxist subversive ideas, like smuggle them into films that become the biggest blockbusters of the decade. Yes, that you, that, that that does go a long way. <laughs> that's praxis. Um, but um, but, but, but which, speaking speaking of which, like the cat returns. Um, like it, it, we we might see it as like kind of like a a lesser. Um, Ghibli film, which I definitely would argue it is, but but it was still like a box office su- success. I think it it still like topped the uh, like at least the summer season in Japan. It it was the highest grossing movie in that year in, in Japan. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. I think it's definitely right to say this was definitely in the 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 lesser of a lot of the Ghibli movies. Though, again, I would by no means say this is a bad movie. And in fact, again, if, if it's supposed to be a project for the more younger people at Ghibli who aren't as well trained. I think it's kind of a. It shows a lot of promise. Kind of sad that uh, the director uh, Hiroyuki Morita didn't actually do much after this. Uh, kind of he, a shame because there's definitely a lot of like talent going on at the visual department, and it's like a very competently like animated movie. So yes, uh, I have, uh, uh, as well he as did a lot of work though, right? Uh, as a not as a director, which is probably what you're referring to, but like as a key animator, he stayed yeah, yeah, they stayed on as an animator and in even a lot of like good shows, yeah, uh, and, and even stayed as a key animator to like for do Prince, uh, Tale of Princess Kaguya, which we are going to talk about in a few months. Oh, yeah, but so definitely a lot of good work there. Quite a task to be a key animator on that movie. Like holy shit. Um, but yeah, it's right. Like he didn't do much in terms of directing anymore, except for Bukurano, which uh, I got haven't figured out my facts. Is that after Cat Returns or before? I believe it was before, <laughs> if I recall. Uh, yeah. No, it's after. It's two thousand seven. Okay, so Bukurano in uh, 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 All right, I think the manga yeah. came out before, yeah. and that's what I'm thinking of. But yeah, there's I, I, other I great they, they, talent. Uh, yeah, they selected him for the project because he had so, 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 uh, like th- this neat sense of of like character appeal. Uh, yeah, I, I think is uh, why he, he was like this decided to make the storyboards and uh, yeah. I think a lot of like like they they had a number of animators uh, try out doing some storyboards for the the project, which like gradually expanded from like uh, like this this cancelled project. They still had some character design and animation studies for you know with the cats. Uh, into like okay uh, like a 20 minute short into a 45 minute project into the uh short feature length uh film uh we uh that we are talking about today yeah we, an we hour can, and 15 yeah. minutes uh, i think it's the, the shortest ghibli movie it 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 should be yeah it is the shortest ghibli movie uh but let's just get into a little bit of the these details which are just outlined uh broadly which is that of course it was first commissioned by a japanese theme park who then, uh, uh, and Miyazaki accepted under the condition that he gave to his staff, he said he wanted um, the Baron to be featured, 
Mm. Uh, uh, the Baron, which is like the cat statuette from the antique store in Wisp of the Heart. And he also wanted the antique store to be featured. Those were his conditions. Yeah. And then he asked with the mangaka Aoi Hiragi, who also wrote the manga for Wisp of the Heart, and commissioned her to write a manga. Well, the manga was written, but the theme park cancelled the, their, their set of the project. So, you know, as you said, Playdon, like Miyazaki took the already done work on the cat project and gave it to the future Ghibli directors as a little testing ground. And now we come to the other, I guess, very prolific talent that is uh, stands out on the on the billing list here, because alongside Morita, who developed the film into a storyboard uh, of 525 pages almost on his own, credited as scriptwriter is Yoshida Reiko who nowadays you would know if you're a fan of the work of Naoko Yamada, which you should be because she's basically the big new, biggest new name in anime. Uh, she's she's, she's legitimately one of my favorite directors in, yeah. an, in animation or otherwise. So Yoshida Reiko and Naoko Yamada collaborated on works such as K-On, Listen the Blue Bird, Tamako Market, uh, Koi no Katashi. Um, oh, hold on, I could be giving misinformation. I'm not sure if Yoshida Reiko also wrote uh, Koino Katashi alongside uh, Naoko Yamada, but that's fine. Uh, it's also based on a manga also. Um, but th- she is a remarkable talent and also ha- is known for works such as the Aria series, which she worked on the adaptation and uh, also Digimon. <laughs> surprisingly, Digimon a lot of- Adventure, both yeah. seasons, which are, yeah. I'll stand by those. They're quite good. Yeah, But at the time, Yoshida Reiko was very much not a name on the map yet. I think one of her few credits at the time, uh, uh, and uh, Steve um, in his video on this movie put it into a little neat little joke. At this point, she's mainly known for Tokyo Mew Mew. So uh, <laughs> unlikely pick for uh, Studio Ghibli script writing, but you know she did it, and uh, uh, this is where we're at now. I, 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 I'd argue still it's like a gem in the rough mm-hmm. situation in this time because I, I think we're going to talk about the script work a little bit later. And I'm not yeah. sure how much of this goes. It's, of course, an adaptation, right? So I'm not sure how much we can tell who is like mainly or chiefly responsible for um, m- some of the shortcomings we think this movie has. But uh, let's just keep it in mind. Um, but yeah, then they developed that into the storyboard. And then... Miyazaki and uh, Toshio Suzuki looked at it and they decided to produce it as a feature length film based on this storyboard because, and I quote, uh, the main character had a believable feel to her. So the storyboards convinced Miyazaki because Haru had such yeah. a realistic feel to her. I mean, I, I, that I, is I think, one I think, aspect. Um, yeah. I, I, I think it's, uh, th- 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 there is actually like a, a lot of like uh, visual and character appeal to the movie, which is one of its bright spots. I think now is like a good time to um, just go through the the film because I think like of all the um, of all the Ghibli movies we've covered so far, this one is the most likely to have people who have not seen it. Uh, so, so just uh, just for reference, um, the story is about uh, Haru, uh, who's a seventeen year old uh, high schooler. She's uh, she's a bit of a klutz. Uh, she has a crush on a guy who seems to like. Uh, have a girlfriend and she uh, she's just like kind of like awkward and uh, unsatisfied uh, until uh, the, uh, her chance comes to prove her kindness by uh, saving a strange cat carrying some weird package that's crossing the road. Uh, she saves it from uh, being hit by a truck, um, at which point it stands on its hind legs, uh, looks at her and thanks her, you know, talks to her. And it's like, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll, uh, we'll, like definitely, like I'll, I'll see you around, and um, and during the night, uh, a parade of, uh, walk, you know, uh, two leg, like walking on their hind legs, uh, cats, uh, come along, uh, and the cat king, who turns out to be the father of the cat prince, uh, which was the cat she saved, um, personally uh, thanks her, gives her this like strange contract that the cats are going to help her out. And uh, and that uh, and declares that like uh, he also wants uh, her to marry the uh, the prince. So and of uh, course shenanigans yeah. ensue. Shenanigans ensue for a while until um, uh, she, she she's like told in more detail like uh, you've been invited to the cat kingdom and you're gonna marry a cat. Uh, and she's like you know I mean uh, all things considered that sounds kind of nice being a cat. Um, and uh, but, but but at that point she also gets uh, like contacted like mysteriously a, a strange voice says uh, gives her directions to the cat bureau, 
uh, which she finds by uh, and stop me if you heard this one before. Uh, following a um a a, a fat uh like white beige uh, cat uh, around uh and uh, and down some uh, narrow alleyways until she arrives at, at this like little strange house uh where as the sun sets she see a glimmer in the eye of uh, a figure inside and it's Baron uh, Humbert von Gekian um whom we remember from the uh whisper of the heart um however like as soon as they've like understood her situation she gets whisked away uh, into the um the parallel world of of the cat kingdom and it's up to the baron uh, and the uh the uh the fat cat uh, muta uh, and their uh, raven uh, toto to uh to save her and that's like just about what the movie's about pretty much uh, yeah um so the first thing i guess people will notice when looking at this movie is it doesn't look like a ghibli movie at all um i think we we had a, we joked earlier uh, around a little bit about it looking like a, <laughs> what bargain hosoda movie <laughs> yeah bargain bin hosoda <laughs> it definitely does um, have that kind of like uh thin lines very simple face design that yeah you'd yeah. see in something like hosoda yeah, and also like looks the, more... the girl who leapt through time and uh yeah and it looks much more traditionally anime than, like, uh, could this be the only Ghibli movie which doesn't have the usual Ghibli faces, uh, except for Tale of Princess Kaguya? Uh, I don't know. Uh, my neighbor's the Yamadas. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> Is that cheating? Fuck, yeah. No, it's not cheating. You're right. My neighbor's the Yamadas also not. But it's like one of those rare cases where, but those two movies had really distinctive, unique styles, whereas this movie just has more of an anime look to it. Like, the more, uh, uh, rounded the more youthful like 2000s era anime style not quite like a tv anime right it looks way better than those uh usually do and um yeah, but it and does look quite different. like aside from the character designs everything else is very ghibli still like the backgrounds uh have have this uh a, a painterly um a style to it with a great sense of uh, like color composition and the uh the, the like character animations are like um, are like uh, detailed in the very like uh, selective uh, and then like yeah uh, aesthetic way that uh, Ghibli movies uh, very tend much to so. be animated uh, animation which, like, feels uh, very Ghibli. which obviously like it it is st- still a uh, studio Ghibli and uh, and its animators working on this it's just that like the talent in charge uh, are like relative newcomers so I, I imagine that might be what results in this uh, blend of uh, yeah. styles. And we have a very wonderful scene, I guess, that captures the uh, character that acting very well is is the very start of the movie with like an alarm bell ringing and Haru waking up in her bed. And you kind of see her very hasty morning routine, her checking herself out in the mirror and just seeing if everything sits right and then walking downstairs and then getting greedy because she sees her mom eating breakfast and she can't eat breakfast because she gets has to hurry to school, you know. Uh, she doesn't even have time for the signature like toast in the mouth Yeah, run. she can't even get the toast in the mouth. She's so, sl- so late. How, how yes. pathetic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, yeah, I, th- I think I understand what Miyazaki was kind of saying, where it's like they clearly spent so much of the movie around like uh, Haru's character animation and like really selling her as this kind of real person. And like, of course, they make her a klutz, so you can do endless scenes of animating her falling over in like funny ways or like tumbling around. Yeah, but even incidental. Really adds a lot. Even incidental cuts in it, like like the 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 I love the moment in the title card of this movie. She's like sitting, uh, I think, on the rooftop of the school, yeah, like yeah, looking, she, she's, and uh, she's just gazing like, at the, the sky yeah. and like wistfully, like oh, I, I always think were more interesting. And, and then, then a yeah, fucking ball hits her in the back of the head. And she's just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or there's the really great bit where she's like carrying the uh, the bin, and she uh, she immediately trips over, and then she sees her crush. Uh, like across the way, and he's like, "Oh, mind your step to the to the girl he's actually with." That's a, uh, that's a great yeah. uh, comedy juxtaposition there. And, and then, I and have then to she say, falls over some more. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have to say this is a good fit. Like this focus on character animation is what makes a lot of this movie very fun to me, um, especially because then we get into weird little cats that are running around and doing weird like little things and dancing. And, yeah, they're all like you know, standing all on their dancing. hind legs, and they all yeah. they all kind of like move in this very odd way that's like it's not quite human. Like they really thought about what if cats were walking about on on two feet and like yeah, what they're, kind they're of, like swaying they kind of have like around. weird yeah. elongating elongated bodies like cats have so it's this really 
his interesting style. Yeah, and and, and well, I, well, I think with, it with really did it actually. Uh, with the exception of the of the Baron, who like moves very deliberately, very poised, uh, in contrast with the rest of the cat cast, which gives him this this uh, different aura uh, from the rest, which is a great little touch. Yeah, and there's an, also an interesting thing about it where it's like the the Baron isn't a cat. The Baron is a statue that's yeah. just made to look like a cat, and he's actually just like a an object that's come to life. Exactly. Like you look at all the other cats, they they have paws that they are like holding up. He doesn't. He has fingers, but like yeah. he has gloves on, and I do not want to see what it looks like without the gloves on. Thank you. Oh, very those much. gross cat fingers. <laughs> but but yeah, you have tons of little uh, cute details in animation or in the backgrounds, just like put in there. Like for example, when the parade of the cats turned up at our house, we had those bodyguard cats, which just had like were like black cats with like a white. With a, like a yeah, white that's patch. my favorite piece of design yeah. in this whole movie. And, the and they were just cats. Yeah, exactly. It was looking so great how those bodyguard cats were rushing along the parade and like putting other cats back in their places and all of that mm. kind of stuff. And and just like you know, their 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 fur looked like a smoking, and that's why I guess they were chosen to be bodyguard cats. Yeah. Now, to, just, to, be, to be frank, my favorite like design in, in the movie, aside from, from from the Baron, which is not original to the movie, but like, uh, god, god damn that that. That that guy must have like uh, been been the starting point of a lot of especially female furries uh, in Japan and around the world. Um, but uh, it's it's uh, the main character Haru. By the end of the movie, she admits she has a crush yeah. on the, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's on the kind Baron. Of sweet. It's kind of sweet. Um, and he's like, "Cool, later," <laughs> like like an absolute Chad. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, I meant an absolute cad. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, no, no, uh, I was about to say my my favorite like original design of the, of the movie is definitely the cat king who just like a lot of times just cracks me up with it with that weird like uh n- not cross-eyed what's the ob- opposite of cross-eyed boss-eyed i believe it's i've never heard that people... before but i will well, that's what you. i've heard but yeah okay he's looking yeah. in both directions at the same time that is what yeah. i'm pointing at yeah and I, th- I think like his eyes are different colors and he's just like so so like like his um his fur is just like wild and strange like 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 mad scientist esque and and he's just sitting there on, on his throne and being just just looks like he just looks like the weird cat in in, in that viral video um with the uh have, have you ever seen that one um where like it's just 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 a guy finds this really fucking strange cat with like an overbite and like bulgy eyes and there's like white wild fur and he's like ma Ma, that's a weird cat outside. It's like that. I I haven't seen that, but uh, that's a yeah, fa- funny say. little we'll, cameo. We'll, we will of the source king. it in the description. Mm. All right, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll go it. dig in for that one. Get the archives out. <laughs> well, I do really like the idea of the cat king as the uh, the way it kind of represents that the cat world is all about cat values. So of course their king would just be like the laziest, least groomed guy you can imagine. He's just this big fat. Uh, lay about because that's what cats want to do all day yeah and, so like, and they're like king is the, is the pinnacle of that yeah they're carting him like in front of her house and it's like yeah the king wants to thank you and he's like thanks <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> which is also great for the voice acting here um i watched the movie in in japanese with the japanese audio which was also pretty great uh, because the king had just this like really growly low rumbling tone to him but uh, i hear in the english dub uh, he's voiced by tim curry which is yeah fun. tim curry does a does a great job as always really sells the the cat's kind of like weird lecturousness so I actually sort of feel like this movie, I'm usually like going for the Japanese audio uh, when it comes to these Ghibli movies, but this one feels like, you know, it is not like a very demanding watch. It is a very like a relaxed sit down and like, you know, just watch some f- f- cool cats do some funny shit. I feel like this is a dub movie, like for real. Like this one, just put it on the dub, uh, have Anne Hathaway as Haru, have Tim Curry as the, the Cat King and just enjoy uh, the strange performances and, you know, the, the hijinks of the cats and so on. I, that's what, how, I'm, how I say you, you, should, you should go for this movie. Yeah, like it, it, uh, and, and that's definitely like where, where it has its appeal. Like uh, the, the, the character design, the, uh, the an- animation uh, appeal and detail, the... The really like nice uh, color palette of, of like uh, pa- pastels uh, and blues, um, it's a uh, it it's it's a uh, it's nice. It, it is, is e- indeed yeah. nice. 
And you're right, like the pastel colors do add something that makes this movie even brighter like than some of the brightest Ghibli movies, uh, except maybe Poco Rosso, which is nice and bright because of the Adriatic uh, uh, Sea's uh, vibrant colors, but it, it is a very bright movie, and that's, that's also nice. And also, like, just while we're on tone and, and like, color a bit, um, the movie is also doing, like, if we would talk about the plot that would happen during her Haru's stay in the Cat Kingdom, the, it sounds very dark, like she's getting captured and she's kind of being forced into this marriage and the king she's is there. Gradually, and that, her, yeah. gradually, her body is changing into something she doesn't recognize, like it's, like, like it's the, the fucking uh, donkey boys in Pinocchio or some shit. Yeah, and, and like the king is like, oh, you peasants entertain me, and then he's executing like the people who don't entertain him. But fun fact, and oh, this no, is kind no, of... Correction, yeah. he throws them out of the window, but as exactly. we know, cats always land on their feet, except apparently uh, for, for Muta. Yeah, um, the... the, the this is the fun this is like one of the jokes that I really liked when I saw it and I thought it was kind of clever it's like he's executing them because he sends like executioners there and they throw those cats out of the window and we don't see what happens to them but later in a scene just in the background they're just sitting outside really kind of like 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 sad <laughs> and then really nothing dejected, happened to them yeah, yeah, yeah. they're just dejected and, and sitting there kind yeah. of sad I like, think it, it, it kind of matches Paul Caruso in that kind of tone as well where we said it's like it's a world where like nobody's gonna die like being displeased or like angry it's kind of just all in this like silliness because it's like cats themselves are also permanently at play and never take anything too seriously yeah and uh, I, I, I think that those scenes where he throws them out the window are like some of the like best made like just the comic timing of the cuts is very well done which is interesting because like that's i i believe one of the original scenes from the manga which uh, which I like read through uh, just to like che- uh, check what's different. Um, he, the, the, there's there's no like big parade of strange entertainments like like like, like the the cat that that like does the weird thing where they make a big cat face out of their body. That was a strange oh, yeah. still th- idea. Uh, like who, that- who came up with that? Okay, I want to so know why, how they came up with that. That is true, but that has a little uh, tradition in Japan. There's like, uh, uh, if you watch like old movies or, or older anime, even where you have like get togethers where older people get drunk, you will often have like one of the older people, like who has a fat belly, uh, uh, undress and, and paint a face on their body and dance around. That's like a thing they, they that, that's like a thing that is kind of like a trope of how drunk Japanese people uh, entertain themselves a little bit. Uh, uh, for instance, in Ashito no Joe, there's multiple scenes of this, but I know that there's more than just that, but I just can't remember them off the top of my head. But yeah, this is kind of like harkening back to that, but it is more fun by it being a cat, I believe, because that was quite uh, <laughs> the weird sight. Yeah, um, but uh, I, th- I, th- I think this um, might be a good time to get into, like, the stuff that doesn't work as well as, as these. Like, it has all these, like, little charming elements, little charming moments, but I think as a cohesive whole is where the movie uh, yeah. is very lacking. So, so let's conclude the plot summary by just giving a little bit more detail on the second half. And it's not a lot, because basically once we arrive at the Cat Kingdom... Um, Haru and uh, uh, Haru gets basically taken into the castle and put into a little dress and a dinner banquet is given for her and everything's like, yeah, you, you, you're going to get married and so on. And after a while, when she is in that perilous situation, the Baron arrives, they dance, they have like a showy moment and then... Yeah, he has a mask on, he's disguised. Yeah. And a then, true, uh, yeah, yeah, and then dashing they start hero. escaping uh, with a dashing hero, yeah. And the yeah. escape is a lot of running, a lot of hijinks. There's a labyrinth involved, like a huge tower set piece, a lot of climbing, jumping, action, and so on. Um, but ultimately, the prince that she saved in the beginning of the movie arrives and is like, "Wait, hold on, nobody, Dad, you didn't tell me that I am supposed to marry this human girl. I, I, she, I'm already, I already have a fiance, and it's this beautiful white cat." And this beautiful white cat is incidentally the one that Haru saved when she was a child. We didn't mention that earlier, but it's kind of... Yeah, it's a brief oh, flashback yeah. when she talks to her mother uh, yeah. early in the movie. And that cat was also the one who warned her and told her go to the cat bureau because she uh, anticipated the turn of events uh, 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 to turn out like they did. And, well, a little bit more hijinks in action. And then ultimately they all jump from the top of the tower and fall into the real world arrive the baron says well i did my job haru says i love you mr baron he's like okay buddy and leaves 
Ja, yeah, leave, leaves on red. Ja. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. what, a, what a great moral for this story. She initially thought she didn't want to sleep with a cat, but then the Baron shows up and suddenly she does. So, you know, like, racism bad, kids. Yes, don't, I, don't think about your prejudices. Um, but yeah, th- this is basically the plot. And I want to kind of like go into the idea that this, and we talked a, a tiny bit about this before the podcast, but uh, this movie is oddly Western in structure. I felt like it does feel like a like little short adventure flick with a very traditional coming of age slash hero's journey structure but oh boy it is remarkable that in 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 some ways or in how many ways it doesn't get it right let me illustrate just one uh, and i think platon you have a you have a ton more but oh yeah uh, just go ahead one way is that uh, as platon outlined earlier in the plot synopsis she starts out being we have two conflicts to her for the coming of age story first she's clumsy and second, she has a crush and uh, it doesn't really work out. So she's like, well, wouldn't it be beautiful if I wear a cat? Because as a cat, I can just laze around. Then she gets whisked away into the spirit world of the, of the cats, the cat world, not the spirit world. And uh, throughout her journey there, she learns some things because gradually she's turning into a cat. But by the end, she unturns into a cat. Right. The yeah. idea is that sh- the thing she wanted to escape from, like, oh, my crush, and oh, I'm, I'm clumsy, I want to be a cat, she kind of found reasons to not want to be a cat. However, well, by the end of the she movie, really... she comes back and isn't clumsy, and she isn't caring about her crush anymore, but nothing... She also cut her hair, got a haircut and some new clothes, and, and she gets up early, uh, even earlier yeah. than, than her mom. All of well, that stuff. Ha- look how she's changed and evolved. Haven't we truly been on a journey with this character but nothing um, happens in the movie that actually changes her you you could have stopped with nothing happens in the movie like it's, it's yeah. so um yeah i think that's the most obvious thing the movie runs a real problem of it's it's short but it doesn't like it, it's not using that shortness to be like punchy and get to everything it needs to and it's not like long enough to really elaborate on some of the characters and give them a bit of depth and like so we can kind of relate to what happens in exactly. the story. So it, it's kind of this weird in-between ground that doesn't really work most yeah, of the it's, time. It's missing parts, um, mm. uh, which which is why. Um, so 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 I I have a, like uh, a few things because this movie is actually like a great illustration of how you can have like a a, a useful like a starting concept and a classic structure. You know, of like a a, a character who's unsatisfied goes on a magical uh, journey and comes out changed. You you can have all these things, and it won't work if the story doesn't function underneath. Uh, and and that's the thing Cat Returns does. Uh, it has all the affectations, all the surface level details of um, a, a meaningful story, a meaningful character arc, a, uh, of of metaphors, of action. But it doesn't have the underlying like story functions uh, that you need. So uh, I, I've I've outlined like three key issues uh, that uh, this movie is very like useful in in like addressing um so the the clearest one is the one we're already talking about right now that there's no clear character arc for uh the main character for haru or anyone um, really yeah so so general g- generally uh, a character arc uh, especially for a protagonist is structured around something um something they want and something they need and how those two things clash so what a character wants is like what they desire at the start of the story, what they might be actively doing something to achieve, um, while what they need is is what is actually like it, what what they in their soul need in order to become a better person by by the end, which might tie into the want or might be contradictory to it, which is how like many of the most satisfying uh, like and like very like um, approachable character arcs. Uh, uh, come from see for example um, for instance uh, a classic like uh, Casablanca uh, will have um, a Rick uh, who uh, like wants at least at least he declares that he wants to like uh, get through like the, the world war without uh, with, without like stepping on too many toes and keeping his business afloat but what he needs is to like set aside his own interest uh, and even sacrifice his, uh, his own romance in order to do the right thing or in uh, in Mad Max Fury Road, you have uh, like uh, Furiosa who has the character arc in that movie. Uh, Mad Max is more like along for the ride, uh, pun intended. 
Um, Furiosa <laughs> wants to escape to uh, to the to the the green place to a place where things are better and uh, she has a community. But what she needs is to realize that like uh, that place is not there, and there is um and to find and build community uh, in the place she already is. Um, Revolution. So what? Yeah. So so the question is, what does Haru want? At the beginning, well, it's unclear. She like just has this general emptiness to her. She wants seems, to like, turn into a emptiness. cat. No, she doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> she doesn't. She doesn't. She well, doesn't. I, I think but, yeah. it's, it's kind of clear. Yeah, she wants kind of just a, a fulfilling life where she doesn't constantly feel like she's a klutz and like making mistakes and uh, has like romantic interests. But you know so what? I think the movie kind of goes about those things. But again, I think it's. The biggest problem with this movie is not the nuts and bolts of like what the characters wants and needs, but it's more that like between these there is no like meaningful or interesting connection between the two. Because by yeah, the end of the yeah. movie, she's mature and grown up and whatever, but we don't really feel at any point why that this happens. It kind yeah, of just we're is, I guess, the lacking, resolution to the movie. We're, we're absolutely la- lacking in a connection to the um yeah, to, to, to the, uh, the the magical world, there needs to be more setups and payoffs in order for the character arc to really like work. We need to set up what her exactly like her character issues are in in the in the beginning, which you could argue they do. Like uh, she has an unrequited crush; she she's constantly tardy. But first of all, they do, they they never really clarify why what's what's uh, at the root cause of those things. Never yeah, it just seems like she is, has like poor luck. Like she gets like hit yeah. in the face by a ball. She stumbles around. Like you know, yeah. I, I, I don't it's, know. There's, there's it's just, <laughs> that's just how she is. is yeah, the, that's is just the how the she answer. is. And also, like uh, what and, and she and needs. Like, yeah. Like I, I would argue this movie does not have a need. Like, what does she want? Yeah. Well, we're fulfilling life. Well, big deal. Everyone wants that. Right? It's not very specific to make a movie about it, but you can do it. But what is the need? What did she need to do in this movie? Dance with a baron and escape. <laughs> yeah, is what, that what does she need she, to yeah, realize that's, that's about herself the other in, all, in order to achieve fulfillment? What does she need to realize? It, it, there's no realization. There, there's she no realizes real, like, coming she's to a God furry, God. and that is liberatory. <laughs> yeah, comes yeah, out that, of that, that probably is the biggest thing. Because the the she doesn't like make a lot of decisions herself. She doesn't really that exactly like, is my next core issue. Of what's that's happening. my yeah. second core issue. Is we have a very passive protagonist. So. um like uh, j- just just to get this out of the way, all of these things are like general guidelines and descriptions of how uh, like traditional plot, plot structure usually works and character arc structure Western. usually works, and Western especially. Um, and this and, movie is trying to be Western. Yeah, plot yeah and, you, and you can yeah. you can like go do other things and subvert, subvert it. Like Miyazaki has done that a, sh- a whole lot of times. Uh, sometimes the point is that the character doesn't change. Sometimes uh, the uh, the, the characters' wants and needs are actually the same, and it's all a conflict about getting there. Um, but but uh, but when you're doing this sort of like really basic and traditional, um, like recognizable uh, plot structure without w- without like any like substance aside from that, that's when you need it to really function. And the pa- a passive protagonist is death to an adventure film. So. My yeah. So the question here is like, when exactly does Haru make a decision that changes the course of the film? Yeah, not at all. It's it's so fun, right? Yeah. She's she's taken to the cat world. She can't say no. Uh, she oh even even before like oh I want to turn into a cat. Go to the cat office. She goes to the cat office. She gets yeah. taken away. She gets taken to a place. She gets dressed up in a certain way. She gets set down. She gets danced away. And then the Baron takes her, runs away with her, and then she jumps with him. So it's always like she's always taken by someone somewhere, and something's yeah. done to her, and she doesn't do a whole lot about that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and also, um, like it, the, the, to an, especially when you're doing an, an adventure movie, uh, like an active character making, uh, like making informed choices that change uh, the direction of the action, even like from from scene to scene, that's Im- important. But instead, they're just like, uh, oh, that over there's the labyrinth. Go through that, you know. And they get through that, and it's like, oh, turns out getting through that wasn't enough because we exploded it. Now get to the top of the tower uh, instead. And, and like, there's no there's no reversals. There's even a couple of points in the movie. 
that, that like were really like striking to me where like when she tries to apply her agency and it just like doesn't matter um <laughs> No, 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 like when, um, wh- wh- like, like she decides to go to the cat burrow and talk to them and get their help. Nice. However, they can't help her from being whisked away into the cat world. They, they a herd of cat arrives, you're out. You know, that that that, that didn't really yeah. matter. I, they I, could they could have come along later. And the only moment that I would genuinely call agency is the theme that is straight up like the the reference to Wisp of the Heart, which is like find the fat cat, follow the fat cat. That is still a choice <laughs> you make, right? Yeah, like kinda, even Wisp yeah. of the Heart, it's like you go and follow the cat on this narrow pathway. But she to was told adventure. to do it instead of just being generally yeah, curious. It's, it's true. She um, was told the other to do moment, it. Yeah. Um, the other moment, which is like so so um m- much more striking is um so once uh, she and muta have arrived in in the cat world and we see oh this uh, the scenery and they go to this little village outside the castle and there's a there's the sweet uh, white uh, lady cat uh, yuki uh, whom she doesn't at that point I, th- does she remember having saved her when she was a kid or does she no she doesn't she... remember her then she remembers her later on right yeah, yeah. so um the uh uh, the procession arrives to take her to the castle and she's like, no, uh, uh, can we please invite her? Can we please invite this cat? And then they tell her, oh, she, she's a waitress. She'll be there anyway. Yeah. And then they move on. Like, See, here, here, that's too. just such a little moment where, but, where like, oh, okay, this, like, her kindness towards this cat might, like, change the outcome because she has a friend in there. That would be, Nope. She was going to be there anyway, so it doesn't matter. So here are important told. moments of agency that she has, which we're just going to say for completion's sake. It is, yeah. one, saving the prince. The cat is running across the street. A truck is coming. She's like, fuck that. I'm going to I'm gonna do that. Uh, I'm going to use my, what is it, like a squash? Uh, 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 a a la- lacrosse. Uh, a lacrosse. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was super weird. Lacrosse. I didn't even know they played lacrosse in Japan. Uh, <laughs> they play everything they in Japan. On, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just you she, wait. She... Like five years from now, there's going to be a huge lacrosse manga. That's. I was just like, about to say, when up. is it getting yeah. a Shonen Jump yeah. a sports adaptation there? <laughs> Uh, but but she takes the lacrosse stick, she runs over there, the truck is coming, the truck driver's like, holy shit, there's a girl and a cat on the road, and she just yeets the fucking cat away uh, uh, into the bushes and falls into the bushes to safety as well. That was a moment of her agency, and the inciting moment of this entire movie, and the other yes. moment of agency is when she was a little kid, we have a flashback where she is feeding a stray cat her cookies. And those are the moments of agency! <laughs> I think and that that's covers it. it. Yeah, it's kind of frustrating a bit because you feel like the movie sets up so many moments where we could see her, like, again, make, like, an interesting choice and, like, reaffirm herself in the story as, like, parallels to these other moments of agency, but it kind of just doesn't. Yep. Like, for example, the whole thing with her turning into a cat, it's like she's slowly kind of relenting to this cat world and their cat ways and, like, that she kind of likes the pampering and the relaxing a bit because, like we say, there's a hint that she kind of wanted this a little yeah. bit. And, when, whenever, and so it's whenever like there she's, should have been a moment yeah. where she can like show that she doesn't and she like, you know, she decides to make a decision against that and that's would like, that would de-transform her. Yeah. But they kind of don't. She kind of just happens to. Yeah, but yeah. When, <laughs> also whenever she like swoons about the Baron, uh, she, her whiskers grow longer and stuff. It, it, that, that was at least a nice little thing there. But yeah. that's the weirdest part, right? Like she looks at the Baron, her whisper, whiskers go, grow longer. Then the Baron does all of the work to save her, and once she's in the real world, yeah. he says, well, now you're not a cat anymore. What happened? She's still yeah. in love with him. Like, how do you <laughs> visually... Oh, wait, I, I'm, I'm, I'm ranting wait, now, yeah, but don't how, you do you visually, how do you visually link her falling in love with the, with the, with the Baron and her, her turning more into a cat? Then don't solve the question of love at all and just have her not be a cat by the end without indicating any reason for... Yes, ex- that once again, <laughs> like, all it's all surface and no underlying function. Uh, j- just a- another part of the, the whole like uh, having agency thing um which like when you're doing an adventure movie which especially the latter part part of this uh film is definitely an adventure movie you know with chase scenes with guards with a labyrinth and yeah uh, and e- even a nice little sword fight at the end uh however there are like three times in this movie uh where uh haru seems to be in like a, a hopeless situation and the cavalry arrives yeah. First is uh, yeah, uh, like 
the like metaphorical cavalry arrives, and yeah. at one point, I, I I would call it a literal cavalry. Yes, um, they did not have horses, but you know it's implied yeah. <laughs> yeah. that they rode horses at some point. Yeah. So so first, when uh, when when the Baron arrives at the party with with a mask on, um, uh, t- turns out he f- found a way in, and uh, and now he's there, and he's here to rescue her. And there's even like a hidden entrance, and and also um, Muta was not actually like drowned in jelly. And yes. like wheeled out in front of her to mock her <laughs> uh, during her wedding ceremony. It's <laughs> pretty um, funny though. Yeah. <laughs> Turns out I do he's love fine. The, the kind of dark implication it kind of leads you on, where it's like, is he just straight up dead in that jelly? <laughs> where he had just have his corpse perfectly preserved before us? Yeah, l- l- like like an ancient Egyptian mummy cat. Um, no, um, but uh, but yeah, the Baron arrives. Um, later on, they reach the center of the maze, um, not by doing the smart thing, which they do a couple of times, of climbing atop the walls and just finding it. No, they, they, they do it the old-fashioned way, except the old-fashioned way doesn't work. So they... Yeah. Anyway, uh, they get to the center of the maze, and now we got it. Nope, they blow, they blow up the tower, and now it's all hopeless. However, the prince arrives, and, and it's like, no, Dad, actually, I do not want to marry her. Like, Deus Ex Machina, motherfucker, there's no conflict anymore. Yes. Um, and, uh, and, and, but, but the king declares there's still conflict. I will still want her to be a cat for some reason. And then she goes out and she comes out of the portal. However, she oh. is like a hunt, like hundreds of meters in the air. And like they, they, they try to hold on to her, but like she falls and they all, all three of the main characters are falling. Oh no. Luckily, a swarm of ravens arrives, which they can walk down on. Here, nice. hold on. One more moment of agency I just remembered. I think we'd yeah, be yeah. remiss if we didn't mention it. When the king is like, oh, you want to become my wife then? She's like, no. Fuck no. <laughs> was that even a question? <laughs> like, but, she, but she did it. Like, he, she said it very explicitly. The first time in the movie where she actually goes and, like, says no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that that, that seems kind of, like, significant because, like, um, Muda is like, oh, yeah, you go, girl. Uh, truly, yes. Um, but, like, the, the third... Um, key like core problem of the movie which we've been like on and off about uh for a long time now is the unclarity of the metaphors like th- there's no clar- clarity in what the transformation means what um her relationship with the baron means what even like the uh the contrast between the magical and mundane world means to the character on like a, a metaphorical level it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't connect in that way, uh, which just makes it like a, a type of like yes and story, you know. Yeah. Uh, like yes. and then this happened, you know. Then this, uh, yes. like, uh, and just a bunch of things that happens in a row and makes it feel like someone is literally like doing a bedtime story for a, a girl who watched a Whisper of the Heart and wanted more of the Baron because he was cool and didn't understand the whole, you know girl being a writer thing that was weird so they want a story about the baron <laughs> and so and, and so you start like making stuff up and they they get a bit bored so you make some more stuff up and you make some more stuff up until they fall asleep that's what it feels like watching this movie if yeah, i'm perfectly it, honest it, it, it is it is somewhat somewhat true yeah, yeah. absolutely um and, and the thing is it has been done right elsewhere um just i think at the start of this year uh or was it Last year, um, this it's a uh, 2020 movie, yeah, uh, A Whisker Away, yeah, uh, written by uh, Mary Okada, um, who is the the master of uh, anime teen uh, melodrama combined with some supernatural twist, um, yep. yeah, uh, which directed is also... by Junichi Sato, by the way, also yeah. a huge name, uh, 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 you know, of course, Sailor Moon, Aria, Princess Tutu, Bridget, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, so, so A Whisk Away does almost the exact same thing. We once again have a, a, like a, a troubled teenage girl with an unrequited crush who, um, who makes a deal with a magical cat, which allows her, um, in, in this case, it, it, it allows her to transform into a cat when she wants to. Um, however, it goes, uh, like, at, at one point, she, like, kind of, like, resigns herself to becoming a cat and the transformation becomes almost irreversible, and she goes to this uh, this parallel cat uh, spirit world place, 
um, from which uh, some other characters from the movie uh, go to rescue her before it's too late and she can't reverse it back. The difference, the key difference is there's actually a character for the protagonist and the metaphor means something because the protagonist in that movie is a really, like, really weird and quirky girl whose eccentricities keeps her from, like, really, like, being able to to or like willing to like really connect with a guy she has a this one-sided crush on uh, and and also she has like kind of a troubled childhood and her parents uh were like are unattentive and uh, and divorced and her dad's new girlfriend she, she doesn't really she doesn't really like her so it's it's a metaphor for the way um in which a teenager will like escape like it's it's a way of running away from home yeah, even, she's, even, yeah. even even a metaphor for self harm or even suicide if you want to go that far yeah she turns into a literal stray cat like like yeah. running around the roofs and so on yeah. meeting her uh, 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 her crush and her crush gives her appreciation and love when when she's in cat form because it's a stray yeah. cat and he takes care of this With, stray without cat. without it being like some something that she has to be vulnerable yeah. for also like that there's a lot there um I, I will say whisk away is a better movie than this one but it's not it's not a fantastic movie um it does kind of like lose track of it all with yeah. the at, at the tail end of the film where it gets so dogged down like bogged down in the um uh in, in the weird rules of the spirit world and yeah tries to become way more conventional like it, adventure yeah. thing it tries to be um, spirited away kinda... but also more conventional adventure thing at, at the same time <laughs> Yeah, which uh, which is too bad, but I, I just think it's a really great illustration of how this exact, like almost to the T, exact like tale and problem and like starting point can actually like work thematically if you just give it a bit of work. And it just feels like the um, the writers didn't. Um, what I honestly suspect is um, the 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 what the, the might not have been like time for it. I'm not sure how the timeline works. But I kind of suspect that, like, the commissioned manga was a bit rushed, um, and as and as such, the like skeleton of the story, which was like already like pretty set, um, was a, uh, already a, a, a with all these problems, and uh, the process of adaptation was um, uh, one, one, once again um, uh, Yoshida Reiko. Uh, who at this point was not as as experienced with uh, with adaptation with uh, with script writing in that way, um, might not e- either not ha- have a time or might might be like uh, a bit too hesitant to like make bigger changes or new additions that would change the story, e- even though it would have been for the better. Um, I, again, this is all speculation, but like that might be like how uh, it ended up uh, this way. Yeah, they they should have called that other movie a whisker of the heart. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I've not seen it, so I got nothing. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, um, I I think the movie is really weird. Like the the character turns, like we say, the the lack of uh, any kind of like meaningful change. It, it really feels more like like a TV show. Like I could imagine an episode where it's like the story is always the Baron helps a new person out with a problem, and it's like this time he has to go save a girl from turning into a cat and it's like just a, a fun little adventure show yeah like, and, and, uh, and the cat Sherlock king will Hound, be a recurring like, character which is also a miyazaki show yeah oh yeah you know what this feels like uh this feels like it is the tv movie of a episodic tv series about the king always trying yeah. to kidnap this girl and the yeah. baron always yeah. coming to save her this is what it feels like as if that was uh, that was the tv movie for it and as those tv movies for those cartoon shows usually go it's more of the same but longer yep and you can't do a lot of meaningful changes to the characters because they have to still be in the tv show yes yeah exactly like you have a lesson learned but like a status quo that's uh, kept like the the only th- like they they do make like a surface level, um, but but what, once again it, it, it's all uh, it's it's all surface, all affectation, not like function. But they do like do a whole thing where she's even cut her hair. She's got like some. She feels much more like a seventeen year old um, at the end, you know. And, and you know, the, 
has no. to feel like something's changed. Yeah. By the end, she feels like an old lady. Let's face it. She, she wears <laughs> an old lady dress. She has the haircut. She's like all proper then. then uh, all the kind of, I, I would even say that like her youthfulness, her like klutziness, that was kind of what made her character animation so captivating, her character so visually enthralling. Uh, by the end, that is gone. Like in, in a sense, this movie shows us her uh, a journey from being an interesting to watch character on screen to being a less interesting to watch character on screen. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of feel that. I don't know. I don't think it's, it's, it's kind of made her to make, you know, like that kind of trendy. She's wearing like late nineties, high fashion with the, the turtleneck and cut off sleeves. She's meant to look like a mature girl now. Okay. Yeah, maybe right. it does give off this weird feel yeah. that she kind of is just like suddenly overnight, just not stop being clumsy and therefore kind of just like is whatever is, is a, <laughs> is a boring person now. Which maybe is the lesson, uh, the true lesson of growing up, just becoming yeah. boring and accepting it. Yeah. The true lesson yeah, of I've... growing up, you can't be a chat like the Baron, just fucking give up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, honestly, that feels like the closest character arc is, is, is the standard uh, coming of age, want versus need. You want to stay a child, but you need to grow the fuck up, you idiot. Um, yeah. Which, 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 like, doesn't... But it doesn't feel at all like something that's earned. It's not yeah. earned anywhere. And also and the it's movie... It's actually like the opposite. Like she has a real like fun little childish uh, adventure where, where, where like her only like big decision is like, what the fuck? No, I don't want to be a cat. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, again, that seems, that seems to be what we say about the mixed metaphors and like not latching onto any like interesting point where it's like we have this juxtaposition where it's like, the cat world represents kind of a childhood, kind of a play, kind of a lethargic laying yeah. about like you would as a child with no worries in the world. Yeah, she which, has might, to which might that. actually... But she which... also rejects like the idea of marriage, which also is a very adult idea. Like her accepting marriage to the prince would be almost a sign of growing up and she's kind of like disregarding that. Yeah. She wants to stay a child. So I, I, yeah, I, I don't know what metaphor they're going for. Yeah, the, that, that sort of reading might even justify the very, uh, like I said, bedtime-like structure uh, or lack of structure of, uh, of the adventure part. Because if it's supposed to be like a childish imagination, uh, which she has to abandon. But, um, but it's funny you mentioned it, it, exactly that because like uh, doing like the little bit of research, because there's not a lot of like reading or works about this thing. Uh, the, the only thing that I uh, came up with is this um, article uh, in a journal for Japanese studies uh, by uh, Andrea uh, Germa and uh, Shiro uh, Hoshioka, uh, where they do a, like a gendered reading of the cat returns um, and like uh, kind of argue that like the whole point of the movie is that you have this um, the shoujo protagonist whose arc is all about uh, rejecting like marriage and the uh, the quote unquote housewife trap, which is represented by the uh, l like the, the the allure of uh, the, the cat world, um, and the whole like staying true to yourself thing is all about like not like being so like fixated on becoming like the property or even like the pet of someone else, but like be being your own self. Um, honestly, like the the, the text like. Nah, I don't know. It feels like kind of a stretch, especially because of the issues I outlined earlier. If it was actually about, um, like, uh, be a, the rejecting the trad wife life, uh, so so to speak, uh, re rejecting the uh, the hegemonic femininity that the Japanese society puts on you, and the old school, you know, guys a salary man, uh, girl as the, the housewife type of like role structure then you need something at the beginning uh, but but you don't have like an older relative who's like kind of like pressuring her about like oh you need to be more proper so you can get married one day and ha uh, haru herself is not like fixated on like becoming the wife of this dude she, she just has a crush that's and, and he already has a girlfriend so, yeah, that's yeah, her yeah. problem at the start. There, there, there's yeah, a and failure. I think this, this reading is even more muddled by the fact that the film clearly shows that her mother is a like a, a self-employed, you know, hardworking single mother that's yeah. like done a good job raising her, and they have She's a doing good relationship. Like crocheting, right? So yeah, yeah, so it's it's almost like that trad um, relationship isn't even really on the table from the audience perspective. 
she already kind of lives a life where her mother has has instilled this kind of like strong maternal values into her. So I, I don't think it even works then. It yeah. feels like very all over the place. That, that's so also there, why I say a, that the the academic text really stretches because like there's no real like male character. Like there, there are like male animals, but like male authority figures or anything in it. That it really stretches well, to say, king. oh, she, <laughs> the teacher that turns up with one line about how oh, oh, yeah. she's late. He represents the uh, the uh, male authority and uh, and also of course the um, the, the La- 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 lacrosse uh, racket is 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 a phallic object and yeah. uh, so, like I, I did however really enjoy the part where they declare that um, Muta is a true male feminist ally who uh, <laughs> who who truly appreciates uh, independent women. Typical white knight Muta. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, oh, yeah. He, um, he he drank all the women juice uh, along with the whole feast. All the women. Uh, juice. Just just edit just edit him eating that whole feast with all respect, the respect women, women juice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Respect yeah. women juice. He drowns in it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's yeah. exactly what that yeah. jelly is. Yeah, but like but Han so- Solo, fr- frozen in time in respecting women. Yeah, he's he's just so woke that he that he had to find the Baron to be friends with because so, he, he's yeah. The only true uh, gentleman he can relate to. So I, I suppose, like, uh, I, I completely agree with the problem of setting up what this movie is going to be about. Uh, I'm going to say still that I find the idea that there is something this movie about rejecting the traditional gendered assumptions and rejecting the marriage plot and rejecting the treadwife thing. There is something about this in here, but I have multiple points of failure. But before I present some of the points of failure that I think, I kind of want to talk about what I alluded to way earlier in the cast, which is the Ongaishi kind of narrative. Mm. Because the Ongaishi concept, which is what this movie is named after, uh, uh, the cat's Ongaishi, so her, her like thankfulness or, or, or repayment, is uh, uh, known in a lot of traditional folk tales. One of those is the Grateful Crane. And I'm going to quote from an article which summarizes the Grateful Crane narrative and then uh, 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 going to go into like what it interestingly does in The Cat Returns. So the Grateful Crane part, and I quote now from, uh, uh, I will link the article in the description, is on the on a page called uh, slap ha- slaphappylarry.com, uh, which is a <laughs> wonderful website, but, uh, website name, but yeah, here we go. So after a crane gets rescued from death by a young man, it appears in front of him a second time in disguise of a human girl. The young man is being really helpful and takes the stranger into his house. To prove her gratitude, the crane girl secretly waves cloth out of her own feathers every night to give them to her rescuer, who is surprised at the sudden gift but also really happy because her clothes, uh, her cloths sell easy at the market. Soon after that, the girl appears to be sick. The man is worried and tries to figure out what is the reason behind her illness and peeks into her room at night. When he sees how she actually plucks out her own feathers for his sake, she just flies away. Um, this is a fairy tale narrative about the fragility of give and take, thankfulness and gratitude. And then the the article goes on to describe how these folk tales, as we could just tell, have a very interesting gendered relation. It is usually men who are met by grateful female spirits who are thanking them through sort of domestic tasks. And this uh, article makes clear that the when there are male characters which express this repayment, this thankfulness, this ongaishi, that they are usually not put in positions of domestic tasks. So it is in a tradition of female characters who are making huge health sacrifices for the sake of male characters in a very domestic way. And in Cat Returns, this relationship is flipped. We have a female protagonist who who saves the cats and they're trying to repay by putting her into this uh, uh, traditionally gendered assumption. And she, uh, in the movie, at least uh, uh, supposedly, breaks out of this. So this, I find indication that there's some purposefulness to this sort of inversion of the Ongaishi narrative. However, I saying all that and seeing all these connections to a folktale trope, which she rejects in a sense, um, there's lots of failures. Like, we don't need deep, sophisticated feminist analysis and talking about phallic imagery and like psychoanalysis and not whatnot to point out that 
in a movie where it is all about how men are trying to force her to marry someone, a, a man is still just saving her and she herself cannot really save herself. What is happening is a very dashing man, the Baron, comes in, swoops her out of there and she's still in love with him. So in my opinion, there is an attempt to maybe break something of these Ongaishi folktale gender relations, but it is not successful. The movie st uh, stumbles over itself by, you know, not extending agency to Haru ultimately, except for rejecting marriage at one point. And by having this very dashing young man, uh, the Baron, swoop in and save her. It's like the whole idea that if you want to show a woman rejecting that life and becoming independent, perhaps do it by having her do something independent. Something, <laughs> you know? Yeah, you know, making a dramatic choice that affects the plot would, would, would definitely be a help. Yeah. Um, ju just a, a couple comments on that. Uh, interesting, then, that the mother's job is literally, like, like crocheting, like making cloth uh, art. Yeah, um, I guess. I guess. Yeah. Now you mention it. Um, also, like, like just as, like the, the title. I, I actually like always just assume like the cat returns was about the Baron. No, the cat's back. You know, you remember him. <laughs> he yeah. returns. Yeah, but yeah, interesting I guess, I guess that they so you... changed the meaning of the title. Yeah, like, exactly. In the, in the like translation. instead, it, it's about the the actual gifts the cat give back. Yeah, which um, which actually like if I had to like like. Uh, which I, if I was given this script as a rough draft and was asked to like, what advice would you give? I would be like, you know what? That whole idea of like her getting a contract with these cats and they try to help her, except they are cats. So they don't understand what she wants that's yeah. different from They're cats. They're trying so to give her catnip and mice and all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lots, lots, lots of rats in her locker. And uh, and stuff like like that, and and oh, you're going to be married to the cat prince, and she's like, I, I'm I'm not into cats yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, I, uh, that might be interesting. That might be like something to p pursue. Like maybe we have an arc about her immaturity, which it might be what is keeping her from connecting with this guy who might be more mature than her, and like the the cats become an excuse to like do really fun shit and like quote-unquote, take more control of her life. But, like, it, it ends up, like, being this contract where she becomes indebted enough that she has to get married. And that's not what she wanted, but she needs to be mature and take responsibility. There's something there, you know? There's well, a you lot could of do potential a thing about in the movie. Yeah. The, the cats, want, like, the cats keep on, like, wanting to please her, and she's like, that's not what she wants. And then she keeps telling them that. And then they kind of like, what do you want? And she's like... Well, I don't know what I want, and there you go, a character arc right there, deciding what she actually wants. Yeah, you know, like like we said, this movie has a lot of missed opportunities. Yeah. Could uh, could uh, write a whole book on it. So yeah, I, I think we just kind of did. <laughs> yeah, we just. <laughs> this is save the cat part two. Save the cat returns. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, but yeah. Um, so just just while we're like trying to interpret and we talked about like the attempt at reading it from a feminist angle and the failures of that kind of reading um you got any ideas on why cats specifically is it just like you know f cats are fun to draw and the theme park right asked for cats and i guess mm. that's what we're rolling with or i is think there... it's because i think the big thing is because a cat is not a dog well <laughs> i'm sorry that, that's uh that, that's a uh, that's a reference to uh to cats Musical. Oh. I thought it was a reference to Cats and Dogs, starring Jeff Goldblum. But, uh, <laughs> oh shit, I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, I think again, like we said, there's there's a lot of to to play about with cats, not just animation wise, but like we say in the in the personality, cats just exude in their like kind of like mischievousness, but also like their laziness and their uh, the way they kind of get around. Like that, like she goes to the hidden place where the Baron is by just like going through some random back alleys. You know, it's like. Cats have a kind of whole secret world to themselves. Kind of a bit reminiscent of uh, Pompoko, the way the Tanuki kind of live in this world that we can't quite see. But like yeah. we say, the, the movie doesn't like connect anything interesting. Like the cats are more there just to be like, like really fun and like have a bunch of wacky moments. Yeah. You know what? Speaking of the movie Cats and Dogs, that, that is like one of the big uh, problems because that's like a, you know, talking pets movie where the pets actually have a secret society that protects humanity. Like like a bunch of spy agents, which like 
I could believe a cat, a, an agency of like cats that are like meeting up and doing weird shit when we're not looking. I cannot believe with dogs because like my family dog does not move away from my dad whenever he's home, uh, away, away from anyone who can pet pet her. Like that, that's just not something dogs do. Cats, cats, I believe they they yeah. absolutely do like meet up somewhere. Uh, in a strange uh, oh, yeah, alley. That's why that's they're the villains in that movie. I, I, need, I, need, I, need, I need to stop you here. You need to stop talking or the CIA, the cat intelligence agents will come and yeah. get you. Oh, dang. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess if our reasoning is why it's cats specifically and we boil it down to the traits of kind of I actually have an idea. Oh, oh, I oh, actually oh, have oh, the go answer. Ahead. The answer is because Studio Ghibli was approached by uh, yes. <laughs> a, a theme park with cats, and that's how the project started with making animation studies of like cats and character art concepts for uh, semi anthropomorphized cats. True. That's why. True. That's that it. So, um, yeah, I guess the next question that I had was uh, if we have still more thoughts about why she's turning into a cat. I mean, we said how the metaphor fails. Do we have any attempt to bring it into something cohesive? So, my ideas were kind of like there's a there's some sense of escapism in cat it's like one fantasy magical cat world and when she's like down on her luck she's like oh i just want to be a cat and bum around yeah. and the baron when she looks at him and she grows horny uh, uh, uh she turns more into a cat <laughs> in my view that has to do with her being like going into this escapism of the cat world but you know as we already established the movie doesn't really do anything to change that so I'm left out in the cold with my thesis yeah, that it's about escapism exactly. because the movie doesn't really care about my thesis, yeah. I guess. Again, and again, that, that's something um, when we talk about the length of the movie and how it doesn't really use it that well. It's one of the things I think is really missing is like, what exactly is she escaping from? Because like, just like being late for class a few times, having a, a, a crush who doesn't like you, yeah. that's very 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 normal that's not extreme enough that you would actually want to like run away from your whole entire life you know, so here that's yeah. yeah whereas like 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 a whisk away which we uh compare it to for good reason does actually like like make a good case that th this girl is troubled enough that that might seem to be what she actually wants in this film it's just like something like that sort of happens to her and she's just not she doesn't feel strongly one way or the other. And so they just take her, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Which but is also, not a very good way to write a main character. But also, I suppose I just noticed that kind of like another trope they sort of subverted, not in a very meaningful or effective way, in my opinion, but they did subvert it. Uh, which is that the movie at the start sets up her crush and it's almost like, well, if she succeeds in her character growth, she will be rewarded her crush. Uh, but ultimately she's just like, nah, I don't care about the guy anymore. Like the movie makes sure that there's this line in there that she's like, nah, I don't care. It's fine. I don't need him. So it's like a little bit, a little bit, you know, that she doesn't need to end up with the guy. You know, I, I, I don't oh, know. Actually, <laughs> that, that reminds me, the last shot, literally in that exact same shot where she's talking about the guy, there's a weird moment where her and her friend are, like, talking and they're talking about, like, the guy, and then they look kind of wistfully and, like, happily at two mothers with babies in carriages pass by. Oh, damn. And, like, I feel like that's really strong symbolism to have right there of, like, them kind of, like, looking towards their future and, like, they see their roles right in front of them like that. You fucking debunked that that me also like really that. Odd. Mm, I have no fuck. idea why they put that in. Yeah. That, 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 again, that would probably it seems be a to good completely case. conflict yeah. with the other themes we were saying about her not accepting that life. So I have yeah. no idea what they meant by that. Maybe, maybe it's like a free association thing. Like they had no ideas and then they sat down like, like okay, let's let's brainstorm. Let's draw like a little, little like mind map on our chart. Okay, okay. What happens in this movie? Maturity. Thank you, maturity. What do we associate with maturity? Not being escapist. Okay. Uh, saying no. Okay. Uh, having children. Okay. Let's put it all in. Yeah. G getting over your teen crushes. All yes. right, yeah, I completely forgot about that character I wrote at the start. Let's 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 just give give him a quick moment where like, <laughs> oh, she doesn't care anymore. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. She's like, uh, no, I, I don't want some guy who's just cool in high school. I, I want a guy with a full salary. That's that's what she's looking for. <laughs> that's that's the real the maturation she's gone into now. Yeah, and then we have, of course, uh, the, the the most visually like I guess impact coded scene is when she needs to take the fall. 
And we understand that in cinematic language, like a literal leap of faith is like a formative and turn moment, turning moment, and usually is meant to represent some kind of finality and catharsis and some personal uh, threshold being crossed. However, I really do not know how we can really understand this leap of faith at the end of this movie, like at all, except for them knowing that it kind of fits with a narrative like this. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 all affectation. It's all like following what's supposed to happen, and uh, like not like understanding the underlying structures. I think um, I I think absolutely um, uh, what was what's the name again? Uh, Yoshida Reiko gets like much better about this uh later on with her original work, and also uh where, where she also like embraces the more um the the more structure free uh slice of life type of stories which she does a lot better than this uh thing that tries to do adventure but like doesn't do much with it honestly but yeah i think that's where my kind of comments on the movie and the analysis here concludes i don't know if we <laughs> have anything left to address uh, I have one more thing to address. The, the, I, I forgot. I, I thought it was the bodyguards, but the actual best piece of design in this whole movie was, if you recall, the king looks over his kingdom with a magical crystal ball, but then attached to that crystal ball is just a VHS player yes, and a stack and a of tapes. Bunch of tapes. <laughs> like, that's the greatest thing in this movie. That was my favorite thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, okay. So wonderful. Yeah. I, I I feel like this cast. Uh, looking back on it, turned out a little bit more like a review than our stuff usually is. We usually do focus on the analysis and not the review part. But hey, while we're at it, review, uh, 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 this is a recommendation for all ages. Watch it, uh, English dub, just enjoy it for a little bit of a fun ride. You know, yeah. uh, don't expect yeah, again, it's, too, it's too, nice. too deep of a cinema. It's, it's, not, just, yeah. it's not bad. It has a, a lot of charming elements. Uh, also, the the, uh, the hail to the cat king, hail to him forever and his weird eyes and the dumbest smile in cinematic history. Um, more, uh, yeah, uh, more, more, more dreams, more offerings to the to the Cat King. True. Um, yes. Hail uh, you, Cat King. But but this is really the type of movie where it's it's with the things it's missing, its flaws are much more interesting to talk about because they are much more illustrative and useful than uh, it's whenever we start talking about like the analysis part and like uh how 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 does it deal with gender roles and stuff we get like stopped in our tracks because it doesn't hold together yeah but whenever we start talking about what doesn't work there's a lot to talk about there um so in that way like it definitely is a, a useful illustration of how what what makes uh studio ghibli special what's what makes any great uh like film studio uh, special is not uh, all all the technical stuff, all the character animation, all the background detail, the sense of color. It's the sense of storytelling and getting it everything to fit together. That's that is what's kept uh, Studio Ghibli. Um, that's made Studio Ghibli so great and has kept it uh, in, in the as a cultural touchstone uh, to this day. Um, and unfortunately, The Cat Returns illustrates that uh, very well. All right, then I hope everyone listening enjoyed this cast. We are releasing these uh, 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 every single month. Um, and you can follow us on this here YouTube channel if you're watching on YouTube. And otherwise, just, you know, keep up. And add us in your favorite podcast app. We're everywhere where you can get podcasts. I hope. Um, I think. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Um the next cast that we're going to do is, I think it's Howl's Moving Castle. That's going to be... Yeah, another Miyazaki, yeah. so we'll have lots to analyze there. Yeah, that's yeah, going to be a huge episode. That's going to be a long episode. That's going to be a long episode. I hope not as long as our Spirited Away episode. I have oh, to... it will not be. Yeah. Will I, not. I, think we'll, I don't know if we'll ever top Spirited Away, but, you know, we can try maybe with uh, Kaguya. Why would we try? And I'll shill a little bit the Spirited Away episode here. I, I realize it's four and a half hours, but we go into a lot of really good shit. So if you, listener, haven't yet gotten around to listen to a Spirited Away episode, I really recommend it. I think it turned out really well. Uh, um, 
And I want like enough people to really see all the uh, nice points we had to make. I think it turned out really well. So please go ahead and check that out. And what we also have is two things more. Um, we have a Discord server. We would love for people to jump in there, get some more discussion going. You can find an invite link in the description of wherever you're watching or listening to this. And we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash Norsecast, double A, not the umlaut, uh, as the title would suggest. Um, and there you could decide you like what we do, you want to support the show going forward uh, um, and pledge a couple of dollars. That would be very appreciated. So other than that, I would say uh, goodbye, everybody. See you next month when we're going to tackle Howl's Moving Castle. See you later. Meow.